Good morning. Today, we start the next chapter in our study of the Book of Romans. And to be honest, it's a chapter that is difficult, one of the most difficult in Scripture to understand, and there's a lot of controversy around it. Chapter 11 of the Book of Romans is part of the parenthesis in Paul's letter that we've been looking at that began in chapter 9, and it runs all the way through the end of this chapter, chapter 11, ending with a great doxology of praise. Let's remind ourselves how this parenthesis fits into the overall flow of Paul's letter to the Romans. Without going into great detail, we'll remember that chapters 1 to 8 dealt with the great theological truth of justification by faith alone. Or to put it another way, the way a person's made right with God is not by works, but by faith in what Christ has done for them. Christ's life, his death, and his resurrection for them. Christ lived the life of perfect obedience that we're called to live. And then he died the death that each of us deserves to die because we didn't live that life of perfect obedience. Through faith in Christ, as Paul writes in Colossians 3.3, we die with Christ and our life is now hidden with him in God. What does that mean? It means that by faith, Christ's death for your sin became your own death to sin. And Christ's life of righteousness, his perfect obedience, became your life of perfect obedience, perfect righteousness. This is justification by faith. And justification by faith, you know what it is? It is the gospel. Now, that's a summary of the first eight chapters of the book of Romans. And it took us about a year and a half to get through that. So, you know, it's just very much a summary. From that great theology that we find in the first eight chapters of Romans, Paul will go on in chapters 12 to 16 and tell us what that theology means for how we live our lives. 12 to 16, chapters 12 to 16 are all about application. How do we live out this truth that we've been justified by faith alone in, in the lives we live day in and day out? But in between chapters 1 and 8, that great piece of theology, justification by faith alone, and chapters 12 to 16, how we live that theology out, there's this parenthesis that we find in chapters 9 to 11. Why does Paul feel the need to insert this very long parenthesis well, to see that, we need to remind ourselves of the soaring conclusion that Paul came to as he ended his doctrine of justification by faith alone toward the end of chapter 8. Chapter 8 ends with great assurance, great certainty. Verse 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What's Paul saying there? This is all a work of God. God's the one at work doing this, conforming us to the image of his son. It's God who calls. It's God who justifies. It's God who glorifies. And if God's the one who's at work, you can be sure, as Paul writes in Romans 8, 38 to 39, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present or things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Those are great statements of certainty and assurance. But how do they fit in with the physical evidence that we see? How do they fit in with the fact that the people of Israel, God's chosen people, whom God called to be his, rejected the gospel? And now in their place, the Gentiles have come streaming into the church. How do we reconcile those truths that Paul has been teaching us with the facts that we see on the ground? Well, Paul's purpose in the parentheses of chapters 9 to 11 is to show there's no problem reconciling these two things at all. God's purpose in salvation has been and is being and will continue to be carried out. Chapters 9 and 11 are all about the case and condition of the Jews 
who at the time Paul wrote this letter were rejecting the Messiah. From the time Christ ascended into heaven until just before Paul wrote this, the church was primarily Jewish. In fact, you could probably argue exclusively Jewish for the first few years of its existence. But even though the early church was primarily Jewish, it was just a very small percentage of the Jewish population that had come into the church. Most Jews had hard hearts against Jesus and against this gospel that Paul was proclaiming. As Paul begins chapter 9, he expresses his genuine heartfelt concern over what's happened to his fellow countrymen. Look at verses two and three of Romans nine. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Here's the thing that Paul wants us to see, the question he's addressing. If God called the Jews and made them his chosen people, then why were so many rejecting Christ, rejecting the gospel? And Paul gave us the answer to that early on, at least in summary form, Romans 9, 6, and 7. But it's not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. Now think what Paul's teaching there. There is an Israel within Israel, within physical Israel, the nation of Israel, the ethnicity of Israel, there is a spiritual Israel that exists. They are the ones who are the true Israelites. Paul's point is that while God had special intentions for the nation of Israel, physical Israel, God's purpose was never to save all of Abraham's physical descendants. It's clear just as you look at what happened, how events unfolded. Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. God only chose Isaac to be the recipient of the covenant blessings. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. God only chose Jacob to be the recipient of the covenant blessings. As Paul develops this argument throughout chapter 9, he shows us that salvation is entirely up to God, it's entirely up to God's sovereign purpose in election. Look what he writes in verse 11 of chapter 9. Speaking of Jacob and Esau, though they were not yet born and had not done anything, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. What's Paul saying? God alone is responsible for a person's salvation. It's all about God's purpose. It's not about human will. But in chapter 10, Paul does lay out the other side of the coin, if you will. That is, that while God's sovereign grace alone is responsible for a person's salvation, their condemnation and damnation rests completely on them. Romans 10, 16, Paul says, but they've not all obeyed the gospel. Esau couldn't have cared less about the gospel. He couldn't have cared less about God. He traded his birthright for a bowl of stew. That's on Esau. Men and women are condemned for their own disobedience, their own rebellion toward God. Paul wrote about that, the verse we looked at last week, Romans 10, 21. All day long, I've held up my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. What's Paul teaching? It's God who saves, but man is responsible for his own rebellion. That's the message that Paul gives us here in chapters 9 and 10. And he has shown us those statements are undeniably true based on Scripture, but he's not yet fully explained that in view of all this that he's just talked about, how does that explain the condition of Israel? Yes, Israel had stubborn and contrary hearts, but if God's sovereign over salvation, why didn't God just change their hearts? Why didn't he change Ishmael's heart? Why didn't he change Esau's heart? If Israel is God's chosen people, why didn't God make all of Israel accept the Messiah and the gospel of the Messiah? And that brings us to chapter 11, the conclusion of the parenthesis. Chapter 11 begins with Paul asking a question in verse 1. I ask then, has God rejected his people? There's the question, point blank, straight on. And what's the answer? We see it in the next words of chapter one, uh, verse 1 of chapter 11. 
by no means. In the rest of chapter 11, Paul's going to show us why that's true. First, by showing us in verses 1 to 10 that throughout its history, God has been at work saving and preserving a remnant of Israel. And as long as a remnant has and is being saved, there's no argument that can be made that God is not saving his people. But that's not all. Paul's going to go on in great detail in verses 11 to 32 to tell us that not only has God always been at work preserving the remnant of Israel, but still has a tremendous work in store for Israel at some point in the future. And that means in a few weeks we're about to get into the subject of eschatology. Eschatology is a part of theology that deals with the end times. And in most people's minds, Israel is central to thinking about the end times, what's gonna to happen to Israel. There's all kinds of views that people have arrived at based on their study of the Bible, especially these verses we're gonna be delving into in Romans 11 in the weeks to come. And the church in our day is very divided over eschatology. There's post-millennialism, pre-millennialism, amillennialism, preterism, partial preterism, dispensationalism, and so more. And books on eschatology, such as the late great planet Earth, have made the bestseller list over and over again. People are fascinated with prophecy. The Left Behind series of books and movies swept through America. How we understand eschatology, though, well, it very much is connected to how we understand these verses we're going to be dealing with in Romans 11. Romans 11 is Paul's most complete teaching on the future of the nation of Israel. Much of the dispute about eschatology in our time focuses on what, if anything, is going to happen to ethnic Israel, physical Israel. Now, what does the fact that there's so many different views on this teach us? It teaches us that what we're about to study well, it's not as crystal clear as some people might want you to think. And anybody who thinks they have all this figured out and says they have it all figured out, I would be very leery of, to be honest with you. I would very much argue that there are some esch eschatological truths that we can indeed know and know with certainty. But I would also argue that there is a very intentional element of mystery in all this. All we have to do is see how Paul ends this parenthesis at the end of Romans 11 and verse 33, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. I had to look up inscrutable to see what it means. And for those of you who are vocabularily challenged like I am, inscrutable means difficult or impossible to comprehend, fathom, or interpret. Now think as Paul uses that word, what's he telling us? He's telling us that much of what's going to happen is a mystery and will be a mystery until it does happen. Even Jesus acknowledges, Mark 13, 32, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. In fact, whenever Jesus taught about his return, his second coming, there is just one thing that he emphasized over and over again. Read every word that Jesus ever spoke about his return, and you'll find this is part of every discourse he gives on the end times, on his return. It is that he is coming again, and we don't know when, so it is imperative that we be ready for his return. That's my personal end times theology. Oh, I have one of those other views. I'm not going to go into it this morning. But the main thing about my end times theology is this. Jesus is coming back. I have no idea when. But I know he's coming. And so I must be ready each day. The days are few. I must be ready. Worshiping and serving. Doing what he's called me to do. I don't need to know how it's all going to work out with Israel. And the truth is, I can't know because as Paul says in Romans eleven thirty three, God's ways are mysterious and inscrutable in all this. So I just want you to have this in mind as we approach this subject over the next few weeks. We need to have a genuine spirit of humility, a spirit of humility that leads us simply to worship God and serve God day in and day out, ready for the return of Christ. 
doing the things that God clearly does reveal to us in Scripture, the things that aren't a mystery. So with that in mind, what I'd like to do is dig into verses 1 to 5 and see what we can learn that won't just fill our heads with knowledge, but fill our hearts with a passion for God, for Christ our Savior and His kingdom. Things that will give us hope for today and strength for tomorrow. Paul writes in Romans 11, 1 to 5, I ask that as God rejected his people, by no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars and I alone am left and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Paul begins as he does oftentimes throughout this letter to the Romans with a rhetorical question. Has God rejected Israel? And the answer is by no means. In the Old Testament times, what did God do? He called Israel out of their paganism. He set them apart as a nation with God to be their ultimate king. And God's purpose for Israel was that they would live as his people, as his treasured possession, that they would be a light to the Gentiles, a people who would bring forth the Messiah so that all the world would be blessed. That was his purpose for Israel. It was a seemingly odd choice, though, to pick Israel. From a human perspective, the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, they would have been a far better choice. They had much more to bring to the table than Israel did. Israel was just a bunch of nomads. They were nobodies. Frederick the Great, the king of Prussia, had become skeptical of his Christian faith. And in speaking with his chaplain, he asked his chaplain to prove with a simple statement that the Bible was true. His thinking was that the Bible was true. You shouldn't have to have a complex argument. It should be pretty evident. The chaplain replied to Fed Frederick. He said, I can prove the existence of God with just two words, the Jews. The history of Israel, all the way back to Abraham, right up to the present day, it, it proves the existence of God. It's a remarkable history. It is a striking testimony of God's providential control over human history, especially over redemptive history. There is no other nation in the world with a history like Israel's. After Rome conquered Jerusalem in AD 70, the Jews were wiped out. They were dispersed and sent out of their homeland. And whenever that's happened to any other nation, there's no coming back. But despite 2,000 years of exile, they never lost their ethnic and national identity. Everybody assimilates at some point, but not the Jews. They still have an unquenchable awareness of their ethnic and national identity and a longing for the glory of Israel to one day be restored. Paul spent much of the early part of the book of Romans lamenting the fact that Israel had missed out on the gospel by seeking salvation through the law. And now he poses a question about the consequences. Does this mean that God has finally gotten over Israel and is done with them and rejected them as a people? And immediately, you know, Paul replied and answered his own question, by no means. God's not and never will categorically reject the people of Old Testament Israel. And in the following verses, Paul's going to give us two proofs arguing from the lesser, his own personal salvation, to the greater, God's preserving a remnant during the time of Elijah. And he's going to use these two proofs to prove that God has indeed not rejected Israel. And we're going to look at those two proofs in just a moment. But first, I want to look at the reason that Paul gives us for why God's not rejected his people. It's found there in verse 2, sandwiched between the two proofs. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. The word foreknew is why God hasn't rejected Israel. People often mistakenly look at that word foreknew and they assume it means nothing more than God looking down the corridor of time and knowing ahead of time. And it's true, God's omniscient. He knows all things. 
But if that were all that foreknew meant, God never would have chosen Israel in the first place, or any of us for that matter. Go through the pages of the Old Testament. Just look how Israel behaved. For instance, right after God led Israel out of Egypt, what did they do? They turned away from God and began to worship a golden calf they had fashioned with their own hands. Listen to how God described them at that time. Exodus 32, 9, the Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Do you think, though, that Israel's behavior and all this surprised God? Of course not, because God does know everything before it happens. But if God for knowing they would act this way, chose them. Why on earth did he do that? Because God's foreknowing means more than just knowing about something. It's an intimate knowing, like a husband knows his wife. Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 to 8, The Lord your God's chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who were on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. In the Bible, that is what it means to foreknow. It is for God to make a choice to set his affections upon you, to love you, to make you his own. Listen to what God said about Israel in Amos 3, 1 to 2. And interestingly enough, this is in the context of God judging his people. But still, we can learn from this about God's love. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that, brought, that I brought up out of the land of Egypt, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Now just take a step back and think what God's saying there, even in the context of judgment. It ties right into what he said in Deuteronomy 7. You only have I known of all the families on the earth. Was God saying he didn't know anything about any other families? He, he only knew about Israel? Of course not. What he's saying is that, that he knew Israel differently then he knew the other nations of the earth. Israel was chosen by God out of all the other families of the earth to be the object of God's affection. Israel was chosen by God to know God and be known by God in a relationship with God. And that's why God could never reject Israel in its entirety. This is why God's purpose for Israel isn't finished and she continues to exist when no other nation would have. Because for all these years, God lived in covenant faithfulness because he loved his people and set his affection upon them, even as they lived in unfaithfulness toward him. Now, before we move on, stop and think what this means for you. God knows you. He knows everything about you. He knows everything you've done or have left undone. It's not important what God knows about you. What is important is that God foreknew you. His love is not conditioned on what you've done. It's conditioned solely on his sovereign choice to set his love and affection upon you and to know you differently than other people. And there's nothing you can do to undo that choice. It was made before the foundation of the world. People worry about this all the time. Why, why, how can I know that's true me? How can I know that God foreknew me, that God loves me? Well, if you're asking that question, you know what that means? It means he has. Because you wouldn't care a whit about it if God wasn't at work in your heart, prompting you to ask that question. And if you're asking that question, you know what you ought to do? You ought to act on it immediately. Respond to that call and believe the gospel that God sent his son for you to live and to die for you so that you can live and be with him forever. But Paul doesn't just tell us why God would never reject Israel as a whole. He gives us two proofs, and the first proof is himself, his own personal evidence that proves God's not rejected his people. There at the end of verse 1 in Romans 11, Paul says, For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. What's Paul saying there? He's saying, you know what, guys, I'm a true Israelite. 
I'm not some convert to Judaism. I'm a direct biological offspring of Abraham, but not just a direct biological offspring of Abraham. I'm a direct biological offspring of Abraham's grandson, Jacob, whose name God would later change to Israel. But Paul was not just the offspring of one of those 12 sons of Israel who would become the 12 tribes of Israel. He was the last son born to Israel. He was born of Israel's beloved wife, Rachel, and he was the only son of the 12 who was actually born in the promised land. And so in Paul's eyes, that made him, as he describes himself in Philippians 3, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a true Israelite. But we need to remember this, the Hebrew of Hebrews wasn't the only way Paul described himself in his writings, was it? Think what he said about himself in 1 Timothy 1.13, though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. He's not only a Hebrew of Hebrews, he's the foremost of sinners, an Israelite who at one time hated and oppressed Jesus. And yet, even though Paul was never looking to be saved by Jesus, God saved him. Paul's living proof that God hasn't rejected his people because God in his mercy saved Paul, a true Israelite, who was also the foremost of sinners. Again, no matter who you are, what you've done, I want you to know this. If God has chosen to set his affection upon you, you will be saved. And you can be confident in that. Respond to the gospel. But as Paul continues, he gives an even greater proof that comes from the days of Elijah back in the Old Testament. It's a precedent from Israel's history that proves that God hasn't rejected his people. Again, look what he writes in Romans 11, 2 to 5. Do you not know that the scripture says of Elijah how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets. They've demolished your altars and I am alone left and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I've kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too at the present time, there's a remnant chosen by grace. The background for those verses comes from 1 Kings 18 and 19. It's during a time in Israel's history when they were under the reign of a wicked king named Ahab, and they had become apostate, seemingly, based on what Elijah says, totally so, worshiping an idol. They had turned from God. Baal was the pagan idol of the nations around them. Elijah, though, stepped up and in great faith, he challenged the priests of Baal to use their power to, to bring fire down from heaven on Mount Carmel. An altar was placed there, and Elijah told the priests of Baal to ignite the fire by calling out to God, their God. The priests prayed, and they wept, and they called, but heaven was silent. No God answered. Elijah mocked them in 1 Kings 18, 27. Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's meditating or he's busy or he's on a journey or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. Although the priests called and performed their sacred rituals and cut themselves, there was no response from Baal. Hours later, after all this had been unfolding, Elijah ordered the altar be doused with water and after it was completely saturated, he prayed and God Almighty sent fire from heaven that consumed not just the sacrifice, but all the water and even the altar itself. It's a great victory for Elijah, a moment of triumph, but something very interesting happened to Elijah right after the victory. Worn out and exhausted, he became depressed because in spite of the great victory, there was no great revival in Israel. In fact, Elijah's life had become in peril. Queen Jezebel sought to take it ordered his execution. Rather than a revival, it looked like there was about to be an extinction. There was no one left but Elijah. 
and he was about to be killed. That's his own words. In deep depression, Elijah went and hid in a cave. You remember God showed up. The verses that Paul quotes in verses 2 to 5 of Romans 11 record part of the conversation that took place between God and Elijah there in that cave. God told Elijah that even in the most darkest time of Israel's history, God wasn't asleep. He was working. He was preserving a remnant by grace, 7,000 men who had not bowed the knee to Baal. Even in the very worst of times, God was at work preserving a remnant. God had and would never reject all of Israel. There will be a remnant saved. We'll talk more about that next week. Why? Will there always be a remnant saved by grace? Because God is faithful to his promises even when we're not. That's what grace is all about. And isn't that a good thing? That a remnant is preserved by grace alone. If it was by any other means other than grace, there would be no remnant, no hope for any of us. Why? Romans 3.22, there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then listen to verse 24. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God is at work preserving a remnant by grace out of all those sinful people, plucking some out that he chose to foreknow before the foundation of the world to work salvation, to change them. I hope you're part of that remnant. In the times we live in, it's, it's easy, though, to feel like Elijah, like we're the last man standing. It seems as though the world is going to hell in the handbasket. And do you know why it seems that way? It's because it is. But if you're here and you're in Christ, you're part of the remnant being saved and you're not alone. This work of salvation, it is not our work. It is God's work and God is sovereign and in control. And God's brought you together this morning with other believers for you to be comforted and your faith to be nourished and encouraged. And no matter how bad things seem, there is a reason for hope rather than pessimism because our God reigns. You can see it in the history of Israel. You can see it in the church. The church is the church of the living God, and she will continue to do her work until the fullness of the Gentiles and the fullness of Israel is saved according to God's purpose. It is a sure and certain thing because it is God's purpose. It's not because of us, but according to the work of God in election that a remnant is being saved by grace. No matter how strong the enemy may seem, no matter how they may blaspheme and seem to be frustrating the purposes of God, the purpose of God is sovereign and sure, and it will be carried out. A remnant will indeed be saved by grace. So as the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, 35, therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised for yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their soul. The remnant of grace, living by faith in our God who reigns. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We are reminded this day that salvation is the work of your hand by grace alone. We are reminded of your love for us that stretches back to the foundation of the world and will last through all of eternity. I pray you would help us to live in confidence. No matter what the situation is around us, no matter how dire things may seem to be. I pray that our faith would be nourished even now as we come to the table and are reminded of the love you have for us as you've given your son's body and blood to save us from our sins. And we have to ask this in Christ's name. Amen.